Hello and welcome to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast Team Preview Edition. I'm your host, Ian Hart. It's here to talk all things Arizona Cardinals, number two team from the NFC West. Obviously, didn't quite have the playoff push that everyone was hoping for, but you know what? Still got Kyler Murray. Still got plenty of offensive weapons. Still got Cliff Kingsbury. Not sure how you feel about that, but still got him. And this podcast has still got the one, the only, Dwayne, the great, the rock, McFarlane. Dwayne, how are you? Man, I'm doing good. Like it's MVS day on Twitter for me. So, uh, you know, people probably think I, I, I probably need to set the record clear that I actually, no, I hope MVS is successful. I would actually much rather MVS be successful and everyone just to come gets to come back and dump and just dunk on me. All I'm really sharing is just like my process and the data that I find. And it's like, you always say, it's like, I hate the ADP and not the player. My, my problem is just like, Hey, ninth round, I could have, you know, MVS or, you know, I could have this other, you know, fantasy asset, like, my mind is binary, just thinking, you know, and probability. Let them do numbers. it, man. Let them do yeah. it. And you, me, and the listeners here will know not to reach on MVS. That should be our strategy. Yeah, that is the strategy. So, like, fine. He slides past ADP. I want him. But you know how it gets because sometimes I do think, man, like, if the player were to pull this up, they would think I'm just a complete dick. Like, I hate them. <laughs> and I don't. And so that make, that's the part that makes me feel bad about it because the ultimate outcome would be, man, I would love to look up and people be like, Dwayne, you are an idiot. MVS <laughs> just went off for 1,500 yards and 10 touchdowns. I the hear you, I'm I, just saying it ain't happening. I, I had someone yesterday be like, Ian, I used to like you on uh, in fantasy, but now you become the king of hot takes. And I'm like, look, if you just look at my Twitter account, I guarantee you probably will come away with that impression. But just realize, and as all you listeners know, Dwayne and I do, usually talk through the things enough where, yeah, you know, when there's one quote graphic out there saying I take Renfro over Devontae Smith, I understand <laughs> why you might be like, oh, well, he's just shooting from the hip. But usually we do have a couple data points to back up what we're trying to say, Dwayne. So that's that's the one thing that keeps me going. Obviously, we're going to miss here, but I do think people will be challenged to go back, you know, through our episodes and find too many irrational discussions going on. So now that we've gotten, you know, our little emotional therapy session out of the way here, let's talk some Arizona Cardinals football, baby, because again, Kyler Murray's here. We got a big addition of Marquise Brown, Zachary, Rondale Moore, the DeAndre Hopkins suspension for Beaver tranquilizers, like a lot of stuff just <laughs> really going on with the Cardinals this offseason. It's an exciting time, though, because even if they haven't quite, you know, reached the expectations, maybe some have for Cliff and Kyler, it's a competitive team in the most prolific, you know, side of the country. I don't want to put the NFC West over the AFC West necessarily, but we are oh, truly I like talking. That. I like that. Stay classy. Stay classy, Ian. Stay Being classy. And San Diego, of course. But and San Diego. Which let's go ahead. Team now, but whatever. We'll <laughs> Let's uh, go ahead and stick to our usual format. First, we're going to look at the coaching changes, then the roster moves before getting into the nitty-gritty quarterback, running back, wide receiver, and tight end room. So Cardinals will continue to be led on offense by head coach and de facto offensive coordinator Cliff Kingsbury on defense by Vance Joseph for the fourth consecutive season. So when Kingsbury was coming out of Texas Tech, a lot of people were expecting you know the air raid to become the new hot thing. Cardinals to use four wide receiver base sets, just pass the ball all around the yard. Hasn't exactly been the case, Dwayne. The one consistent we have seen is Kingsbury using this helter-skelter pace. They have actually ranked fourth, first, and seventh in situation-neutral pace per our friends over at Football Outsiders. But the passing game, it's actually been more of a pounds, ba balanced overall offense. In 2019, they were 10th in pass play rate in non-garbage time situations. But back-to-back -back years, they've been 17th at 61%. Dwayne, do you think this is just a two-year sample and now a Kyler going to year four, we're really going to see them throwing the ball all around the yard? Or is this just a fact where, hey, this Cliff Kingsbury professional offense is going to lean on the run a bit more than the public realizes? Well, I think honestly, um, you know, even going back to college and looking at it, I remember when he first came to the league and I was having to, that first year project the Cardinals. Um, you know, I had some conversations with some folks. I was like, this just isn't going to be 70, 30. That's not what air rate is. Air rate is up tempo. It's a lot about the concepts that get used, right? And the way that they think about, you know, reacting to coverages and getting open, running to open space, <clears throat> all those sort of things. Um, but it was never really like just this hyper only, you know, pass heavy offense, you know, for Cliff. Now in his playing days at Texas Tech, you know, <laughs> there was definitely some of that. Um, but as a coach, it was just never really that. Now the, the positive is, you know, and you kind of mentioned the pace, um, plays per game in regulation because be because we can't we can't predict overtime as much as, you know, Ian and I want to predict things like uh, that's one we're probably just not going to get no matter what. So last year, sixth in plays per game the year before fifth in plays per game, just to kind of give some additional context to what you had already mentioned. And and like you said, really across all game scripts, I would just call them, you know, they're balanced compared to the NFL of today. 
And balance for the NFL today is passing the ball 70% of the time when you're trailing by four or more points. They're 71%. Passing the ball when the score is within three points 60% of the time, the uh, the Cardinals are 62%. NFL average of passing the ball when leading, 51%. The Cardinals dead on the nose, 51%. So they're pretty much what we would call a balanced team today. If I was setting up Madden, about to let Landry kick my ass in some football, and I wanted to select the Cardinals playbook, it would probably say balanced on it, Ian. Similar to, I think, our discussion with the Cowboys, though. Yes, they're more balanced than many people give them credit for. But with that pace, we can still see them put up above average passing numbers. And just looking at 2019 through 2021, overall, Cardinals ranked 12th in total plays and 13th in total dropbacks. So can't guarantee that, you know, we're going to kick Kingsbury feeding the ball to specific players we want to. But there should be a lot of plays out there, hopefully, for them to emerge. Looking at some of the offseason moves. At running back, Chase Edmonds, the year, you know, week one and just the starter throughout most of 2021, he went ahead and signed a two-year $12.6 million deal with the Dolphins to presumably be their starting running back, kind of replaced by Daryl Williams, the ex-Chiefs back, who actually had over a 1,000 yards last year. But, man, this really is just a one-year veteran minimum deal. Dwayne, this is amazing to me. Like, D Daryl Williams is fine. He had a good season last year, and if you picked him up, you know, while Clyde was hurt, you got some good fantasy contributions out of it. But the fact that Patrick Mahomes apparently, like, called the Cardinals, or I don't know how that happened, if they called him, what the specific thing was, but for some reason, the fact that Patrick Mahomes was involved in this signing on May 31st, I believe, was when he got brought in, is somehow, like, rocketing Daryl Williams up draft boards. He's now being seen as the replacement for Chase Edmonds, even though he got a one-year veteran minimum contract on May 31st. There's a chance he doesn't make the team. Yeah, Daryl 1L Williams. You know, we're, we will support him as well, but we I definitely don't support his ADP. And I've seen some really sharp, um, not just analyst players, that are really on Daryl Williams. So maybe, you know, I'm missing something, but I feel like even with Keontae Ingram and some of the other things, there's still much to be said about how this depth chart's going to shake out behind James Conner. I will tell you one thing. I don't think there's, there's no way he's going to have, you know, a role that's basically what we saw from Chase Evans. Two very different players. You know, Williams fine. He, he, he can be out there on passing downs. not a bad blocker or anything, but I mean, this is a guy with like a, 15 16 percent targets per route run which is you know well below like what we expect from even running back three um you know if you're looking at historical trends um whereas chase edmonds was over 20 percent every single year so i think there is some there are a few misnomers going on right now in the adp circles around what daryl williams will really be now if james connor goes down and by the time we get through training camp and we know that it that Keontae Ingram really is third string or does or even Keontae Ingram he's a six round pick he may not make the team there could be dominoes that fall that may mean Daryl Williams is worth a 12th 13th 14th round pick but I think folks are kidding themselves when they think Daryl Williams is really going to take over the whole backfield would be my thought that's James Conner I know people think that because some of the data we'll talk about in a minute is not like you know he's not like way above all the league averages but James Conner's a good running back folks like, yeah, does he is he does he look like Camara or CMC? You know, no. Is he Saquon Barkley? No. But watch James Conner play like he's a really good player. And so to try to think that Daryl Williams just plugs straight into 100 percent of James Conner's role, I think that is the main thing that kind of has me confused with ADP right now. If they had signed Daryl like back in March when free agency started, that would be one thing. If they gave him yeah. more than the veteran minimum deal, that would be another thing. But yeah crossing a lot of boxes right now in the hopes of him achieving this role that maybe he does Dwayne, but yeah, I'm not going to spend uh it's getting to the point where it's not exactly it's a 12th man. Right? It's a 12th round pick. I don't want to say premium, but it's not nothing. Like we're not well, talking talked about yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. You I was saying going. like, we're not talking about like Hassan Haskins or someone like in round 17. We're like, yeah, we got to jump through some hoops here. Like 12th round. I don't want to be jumping through that many hoops, man. Rounds eight through 12 are just money right now and they are so juicy they are round 12 is kind of your last stop to, to to grab some of this maybe young receivers that slid a little bit um you know if you're if you're needing to do some things you know at quarterback especially if you're in best not ball, daryl you, williams yeah you don't have to do daryl williams right there like daryl williams fine you want to do it 13th round people we'll let you do it in the 13th round don't send us any screenshots in the 12th <laughs> 
All right, real quick, just a couple wide receiver and tight end notes. Uh, we can save the most bulk of the analysis for those sections. So yeah, Christian, yeah. Christian Kirk. Oh, you're good. No, it was good. Uh, Christian Kirk signed a, you know, monstrous four years, $72 million deal. That was a fun day on football. Twitter, 3,044 total yards, 17 touchdowns during his four years with the Cardinals. Good receiver. I think we can all agree that money, pretty absurd. Uh, accordingly, with the DeAndre Hopkins suspension, uh, six games, Marquise Brown was acquired from the Ravens alongside a third round pick in return for the 23rd overall pick in the 2022 NFL draft. Obviously, had all sorts of success with Kyle Murray at Oklahoma, went over 1,000 yards and had 91 catches in his final year with the Ravens. Also, a tight end, Daryl Daniels and Demetrius Harris remain unrestricted free agents. They were just backups last year. Steven Anderson did sign a one year, $1.2 million deal with the Cardinals. Uh, more so, just get to get him out of uh, Los Angeles with the Chargers because he kind of factored into that rotation. Not expecting much here after they did re sign Zach Ertz to a pretty big deal with about 17.5 million guaranteed. In the draft, they added two skill position players, most notably Colorado State tight end Trey McBride. Dwayne, what a fantastic call by Mike Renner in the PFF draft guide. They comped Trey McBride to Dallas Goddard, and now McBride's going to start his career on the bench behind Zach Ertz. Like, come on. I saw that. That was so funny. <laughs> what more do you people want? One hell of a comp uh, by the PFF draft crew. But yes, Trey McBride, all, you know, hijinks aside, six foot four, 246 pound receiving friendly tight end with above average run blocking ability. I mean, again, that Dallas Goddard comp is. What we're looking for in a player, just unfortunately don't want to be behind someone like Zach Ertz, who just got paid a lot of money to continue being the starting tight end. Also added six-round USC running back Keontae Ingram. Had a pretty damn elite 91.6 rushing grade last season, but again, just kind of handing the pro the prospect evaluation over to our draft crew the big kind of negative on him was his lack of potential pass game ability. So maybe he can take that early down role from you know, if James Conner gets hurt, but not expecting him to factor into the, you know, every game rotation without at least one or two injuries occurring. Again, though, we'll see what happens in the preseason. Prepared to be wrong when we get new information at hand. So, Dwayne, let's talk about Kyler Murray. My QB2 going into this season. I think you have him up there as well. Let's talk about the injuries because he has suffered an injury during each of his first three seasons. First, there was a sprained hamstring during the final two games of 2019. He suffered a sprained AC joint in week 11, 2020. And then last season, he suffered a sprained ankle in week eight that kept him sidelined for three games. I went through, I looked at that splits before and after injury in 2020 and 2021. He suffered the hamstring injury in like week 16. I'm not going to use a one game split there. In 2020, it was brutal. He went from the number one quarterback with 29.3 fantasy points per game in weeks one through 10, all the way down to 17th in fantasy points per game at just 16.5 the rest of the season. It does go up to 18.6 QB 12 if you take away the last game because he only played half the snaps in there. But either way, pretty big drop off. We're talking about 11 point difference. We didn't see that same drop off though in 2021. He was the QB six in fantasy points per game in weeks one through eight. He came back at the end of the year, weeks 13 through 18. He was the QB seven. He actually ran more often after the injury than he did before. Dwayne, I feel like we're holding the 2020 first and heck second half splits way more against Kyler than what we saw in 2021. And it just seems like him and Russ are the only guys that were really holding this against. I mean, Sean McVay, Tay Seth has done some awesome work showing that Sean McVay's EPA, I think he goes from first over the last, like during his era, basically, first in EPA per play in the first half of the year, drops all the way down to 17th in the second half. So I think generally offenses as we've seen with second divisional matchups, like usually doesn't get easier as the season goes on. They have these injuries. Like what about him not having DeAndre Hopkins for the second half of 2021? That might've factored into the little bit lack of performance. How worried are you about the first half and second half splits with Kyler? Because personally, man, all I see with this is the fact that when Kyler's healthy, he's one of the best fantasy quarterbacks the game's ever seen. Yes. Uh, I have zero concern. I mean, there we go. The the only thing that we would say there could be a concern about, like, is if you just think that Kyler Murray is going to continue to get hurt. And we've discussed that kind of line of thinking many times on this podcast. And I don't think either one of us really buy into it. <clears throat> so my thought with Kyler is just that the ceiling is so high and where his ADP is sitting today. Um, you know, and I've said this before, like he's been my QB two since my first publish of the ranks, you know, and that's back in like February. So I just don't see another quarterback that could give me 5,000 passing yards and 1,000 yards rushing. Now, that, that would be him hitting a bull case, right, for both. We could say that Lamar Jackson probably, you know, I project Lamar Jackson for his baseline of rushing to be 1,000. But he could also just throw for 3,500. 
You know what I mean? Um, you know, Josh Allen can he could throw for 5,500, but him getting to a thousand yards rushing is probably not going to happen. Now he's going to make up for that with rushing touchdowns, right? He's better than Kyler. Well, I say he's better than Kyler. Kyler had 11 freaking rushing touchdowns, you know, just two seasons ago. Uh, and like you mentioned, you know, he's been playing hurt. Imagine that's what I, that, when people come at me with that stuff with Kyler, I say, you know what? You just gave me the bull case. So now imagine Kyler Murray fully healthy for a season. Yeah. He would break fantasy football. He, I have no doubt that if he is healthy, like he needs to be in the top two. And it was probably a coin flip between him and Josh Allen on who's going to finish first. I mean, if you just look at it and you just extrapolate, you know, he's played 16, 16, you know, in 14 games. Now the, the two seasons before, you know, he played hurt, you know, and that's what takes the production down. But if we just look at those, you know, and say we got a 17 game season now, I mean, last year he was on pace for 4,600 yards passing. You know, he, he ended up with 3,794, 14 games. He was on pace for 4,600. Um, if you look at the year before, um, 822 yards rushing. So in a 17-game season, that would be like 875. So, I mean, he's already basically, you know, if we just look at those two seasons, like he's shown us that he can probably get to 4,500 and 875. Um, could he get a little more? Who knows? You know what? But if he just did those two things, like you're going to be freaking elated with what you're getting, you know, from Kyler Murray, especially, you know, if he, if he has a season like that, where also the efficiency all of a sudden pops, you know, because if you look at his touchdowns per attempt, they're basically, you know, just above the league average, you know, we have these seasons and we we've seen it with Matt Ryan. We've seen it with Aaron Rodgers, We see it with Patrick Mahomes every so often these quarterbacks, you know, you just have a year where things work out and all of a sudden you're throwing a touchdown, like on 7% of your passes. Um, you know, the league average, you know, is typically, you know, a lot lower than that. You know, it's 4.8%, but Kyler's just been right around that. He's been a 4.7, a 5.0. So you give him a fully healthy season. He gets a little bit lucky, hits 6%, you know, with his touchdowns per attempt. Like, man, you're going to be talking about an absolutely huge season, especially if he gives you seven to eight rushing touchdowns. Like, I, I just don't see a way, unless Josh Allen goes bonkers, that you really outscore that. And like, let's see him with, probably the best collection of weapons in his career. I mean, look, it's not like he's been without anybody here, but look at the draft picks that the Cardinals have used at wide receiver. It's one swing and a miss after another. Kudos to them for bringing in Hopkins and giving Kyler that number one. And we saw the 1400 yard season in 2020 and Christian Kirk was fine, but my God, Andy Isabella, Rondale Moore, the guys just can't stay on the field. It was one tight end after another before they got old man, Zach Ertz in there. Obviously AJ Green's corpse, Antoine Wesley, you know, not exactly helping out a bunch as well. So on the season last year man second highest rate in the nfl of just not having a single pass catcher considered open by pff so really wasn't all easy for kyle murray and again when he came back from injury he was running around i don't think he was really a worse quarterback i think a lot of it was having to play without hopkins with rondale more banged up and yeah like some of his passing numbers are going to go down when the offense really becomes revolved around feeding the ball to zach Ertz in the shorter areas of the field so and Ian, since, remember yeah. remember last year to start the year, they were blowing everyone out. They didn't. He didn't even have to throw the ball at the beginning of the year, really. Like the the Cardinals were. What they get to like eight and zero? I can't remember now. Might have been nine and zero. They 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 were off to a super hot start. Like they were leading their division, even with the Rams in it. Um, and they so were the seven Cardinals, and zero. They were seven and zero before the Packers game. Yeah, and they were blowing people out, and they were getting to sit on leads. They blew out the they blew out the Rams. Yeah. in an early game. So. That's probably not going to happen this year. So that gives you an opportunity to really, you know, push your dropbacks per game up where we could, if there is a year where we see Arizona get away from like basically being 60, 40 and be more 65, you know, 65, 35, meaning 65% of the time dropping back to pass 35% of the time running the ball. Like I could see it being this year. I mean, here are their games of 50 points or more. They start off with Kansas city in week one, 53 points. Vegas, 51 and a half week two. Week three, they get the Rams. 50, the, Car Kyler's going to be the number one quarterback for sure over the first three weeks of the season. And then you get later in the year, the Rams again, the Chargers again, Vegas again. You get Tampa Bay on week 16. That's a 52-point game. So, I mean, if you look up, they have seven games of 50 points or more. And they've got other quality opponents on their schedule because you mentioned they play on the west half of the United States, which is really good to be on right now in fantasy football because of all the great quarterback play and just the quality of the team. So if there was ever a year where we could actually see them have to push it more, have to throw the ball more and do even more with Kyler to continue to win these games. This is it. 
And if we've already seen the best version of him, like, fine. He's already been fantastic when he's out there. I mean, he's fifth in just the highest rate of top five fantasy finishes uh, per start. I mean, Josh Allen, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers have been better the last two years. But then it's Kyler Murray right there. Like, he's an above average passing quarterback, even going back to his rookie year. Last year before the injury, he was absolutely elite in pretty much anything you want to look at. Bro, since coming to the league, he's sixth in big time throw rate and he's fifth in turnover worthy play rate. So he's like his highlight package is as good as anyone out there throwing the football. And he's also not making these like boneheaded plays. The idea that scrambling quarterbacks are more injury prone really has been disproved. Uh, Dr. Evan Porras did a good paper on this over at Fantasy Points. And yeah, he was able to show that pocket passers are not inherently like less prone to injuries. And that makes sense, man. Why would some statue in the pocket where defensive ends can just, you know, pick a spot basically and pin their ears back. You're telling me that guy's going to be better off than a quarterback that can actually run away from these guys, get down, get out of bounds. I've never agreed with that. Overall, Lamar Jackson, Mike Vick, and then Kyler Murray, all time career rushing yards per game. It's the QB two, Dwayne. Josh Allen's workload is just He's almost in like a different stratosphere. He's Josh Allen. He's we don't have he's, to say anything. He's Josh Allen. Exactly. <laughs> but other than that, Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, like both these guys lost their number one receivers. Justin Herbert just doesn't have the same rushing floor. I think Kyler should be consensus QB two, but he's not. He's QB five. And because of that, he's been one of my top three um, exposed quarterbacks on underdog fantasy. Uh, I'm I'm totally with you on all of it. You know, you mentioned his progression, like just a couple of other quick things. So his PFF passing grade in his rookie year, 61.1, jumped to 77.2 in 2020. And then last year, an 88.1. Like, so, I mean, he's really made these strides forward. You know, his fantasy points per drop back the last two seasons, 0. 0.63, 0. 0.57. Those are both, those are elite. Like those are in the tops of the tops. You know, I mean, yeah, you're going to get an outlier each year that's a little higher than that. But just so you folks know, Josh Allen last year, 0.58. You know, so I mean, he to to your point, Ian, like he's he's right there. We just need him, you know, to stay out there. He needs to be healthy. So I mean, you know, 0. 0.57 for Kyler versus 0. 0.58 for uh, you know, Josh Allen. Like these guys are really close and you're getting a discount. All right, this one's gonna be tough. Now running back the room, we got James Connor, Daryl Williams, Keontae Ingram, and Eno Benjamin. Who every single time we go through a running back to win, we talk about just how much people overrate our ability to predict these injuries. James Conner is the one guy when I had Dr. Evan Porras on the podcast that he was really concerned with going to last year, had him in his red tier. Like this is the most concerning player because he had had a major like soft tissue issue in five of six seasons previous to last year, man. If you look at his injury history, just going back to 2020, he has had verified rib, heel, ankle, back, toe, and quad issues in the last two seasons. Like not good. We've seen it all throughout his career. Uh, Edwin and these other professionals have pointed out that just because of his past, you know, cancer survivor, fantastic story, but kind of going through that recovery and everything his body's been through, being a physical running back, like he is someone that we can maybe guess is going to be a little more injury prone than your average NFL running back. But my God, Dwayne, if he doesn't get hurt, like we're looking at a top five, top six back like he was last season. Overall, PPR RB5, RB9 on a per game basis. And without Chase Edmonds, it was just one workhorse role after another. Overall, he had six games as the Cardinals featured RB1. 77% snaps, 82%, 82%, 91%, 96%, 61% when he was actually coming back from injury in week 18. The finishes in that RB1, RB1, RB2, RB7, RB12, and RB17. Catching passes along the way. Bro, he got 37 of 39 targets last year. He was our third highest graded receiving back, and he actually ranked first in pass blocking grade among 68 qualified backs. So that's my thing with assuming like Daryl Williams is going to take this receiving role. I think James Conner is arguably the better receiver than Daryl Williams, and when you have him already solidified as such a good pass blocking back, I'm just not convinced he's going to be coming off the field at all. Now, like we talked about with Cam Akers and just the upside that's available as Sean McVay gives him that workhorse role that we've seen. Cliff Kingsbury's in that same stratosphere, man. I want to go back and just try to, you know, scrape Dwayne. I'm going to get my scrape on by copy pasting, <laughs> copy pasting a bunch of pages. But uh, like, I want to go calling back. PFF interns, like having them go <laughs> copy paste. Okay, I got you. I want the per game snap rates of like every running back that's played over the past three years. Because if I had to guess, the Rams and the Cardinals have probably given running backs the most like 90% plus snap rates out there. And probably McCaffrey and the Panthers as well. Maybe Saquon. I can give you two years of that data already ready for you. And then you just go get the third. Hit me. I, ha I have it. 
I, I don't have it right in front now. Of me. Okay. <laughs> I, will send, I will send it. I will send it to you. Though. I got All excited. The utilization stuff. No. Yeah. But truly, man, David Johnson, Kenyon Drake, Chase Edmonds, James Conner. We've seen them get every down workhorse roles for extended stretches of time. And I, I again, we talked about the injury risk and everything. But when we look at Daryl Williams. Vet men deal, Eno Benjamin, 2020 seventh round pick, Keontae, Keontae uh, Ingram, 2022 sixth round pick. Like, what's your week one projection, Dwayne? I think it's going to be 70, 80 percent, and that even could be low. Yeah, I don't, I don't see a way around like 70. You know, I mean, 80 is, is, I usually don't predict anyone, you know, for really 80, but, you know, occasionally we will. There were a couple games last year where we were doing it for Fournette and some of these other guys. So, uh, but the bottom line being that, like, when you talk about the rest of the backfield, there's not really a challenger <laughs> to James Conner. None of these guys are challengers to James Conner. Um, it's really just about Conner staying healthy. So looking at last year, and the goal line role is what's pretty interesting here because we've talked about the effect that Russian quarterbacks can have on their running backs, but we've seen the Cardinals be a little bit immune to this, and I think part of that is how the Cardinals have actually been using him. So shout out to Cardinals beat writer. I love when these beat writers start like just barking back at me on Twitter with like actually useful information. Uh, Johnny Venerable, he just – when I sent a James Conner tweet, he responded, they had discovered it's best to pair Kyler with a big back, especially for short yardage because of his inability to convert sneaks under center. Could easily see Conner, health permitting, not 15 plus touchdowns again. So that point about Kyler and the QB sneaks, luckily we can usually verify all this stuff with our fancy dancy PFF tools. Kyler Murray has one, one career QB sneak. Colt McCoy and Chris Streveler and their, all their limited snaps over the last you know three years, they have five, man. They don't use Kyler Murray as a QB sneaker. They just won't do it. And because of that, the Colts, the Cardinals have actually been fourth in total rush attempts and at the goal line among their running backs since 2019. So it's similar to, uh, I think, our takeaways with the Eagles and like Jalen Hurts. Like, yeah, Kyler and Jalen get theirs. But man, there is still plenty of meat on the bone for these running backs. And we saw that last year. Only Jonathan Taylor had more rush attempts inside the five-yard line than Connor. And that's why Connor, even before Edmonds got hurt, he was the PPR RB21 overall. So the question is, Dwayne, where exactly does he come in? I had him really bullishly ranked as like a top 10 guy for a while. He was right there in that tier with Saquon and Fournette. But based on some of the research uh, Dr. Porras has done, I just think that there really is a higher injury risk here with Connor. I'm still cool being ahead of consensus, but I'm not trying to be a freaking idiot about it, you know? So I have him in RB 13 behind Swift, Mix, and Javante, but I think he deserves to potentially go ahead of guys still like Alvin Kamara with the suspension risk and like Cam Akers and Travis Etienne, who also have some level of injury risk. Where do you fall with him? Yeah, real quick on the Kyler thing, he has 21% of the rushing attempts inside the five. They typically are not sneaks, but he does get, you know, about a fifth of what they, and again, that I can't, that's, I'm not adjusting for like the two games he's missed or anything. Um, James Connor, obviously. So Kyler's really the only one I can speak to just because I'm looking back over the three years, right. That Kyler played. Um, so, I mean, he is a bit of a factor, you know, down there, um, but it's probably not, you know, as much as people think. And really, I mean, at the end of the day, they're, they're not going to use they're not going to do that to Kyler half the time. The area you can worry about getting hurt is whenever you're having your quarterback run, you know, down around the goal line where people aren't having to worry about being deep for coverage. They're just basically waiting to like rip somebody's face off. <laughs> like that's where you get somebody hurt. Like what we saw with freaking Jason Garrett due to Daniel Jones last year oh inside God. the five yard line when he got obliterated. Um, like, yeah, you don't want that happening to your quarterback. So um, yeah, where I stand on Connor right now, I think we're really similar. Look, when I, when I look at him, and I'll be honest, like, look, James, look, James Conner's a good running back. He's not way above the league average. And so when you look at him, you're like, well, you know, the profile's nice. It's not elite. And so the immediate concern becomes, you know, so could he just lose work? The problem is when I look at the rest of the depth chart, like, I'm just like, look, Daryl Williams, um, glad he got signed. He's just a guy. Yeah. They're 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 not close. Like James Conner, literally, as much as people want to say James Conner's just replaceable, he's a big step above of uh, Daryl Williams. Daryl Williams last year had a PFF rushing grade of sixty six point eight, missed tackles forced per attempt seven percent. The NFL average is seventeen. Daryl, come on, two point two <laughs> yards after contact, two point nine three is the NFL average. Um, James Conner was actually above the NFL average in all those things, seventy three PFF rushing grade. Um, so yeah, when I look at the rest of the depth chart. It's hard for me to get behind anyone else, but it's not just that. James Conner is good enough 
to go ahead and project him for the volume. The thing that scares me just a little bit, you know, is really more around the injuries. And so right now I've got James Conner as my RB 14. Um, so I've got DeAndre Swift, Javonta Williams, Fournette, Barkley. They're all above him. And I've got Kamara, just Kamara one spot above him. I've got Kamara down at 13 just because I'm still worried about, you know, what could potentially happen with the uh, suspension. But I have him up above Chubb, above Brees Hall, above ETN, um, and just above Cam Akers. Again, I'm still working on my ranks. I'm, about, I'm actually working on redoing them today and tomorrow. Um, so those will all change a little bit, but that's the range that he's in. Mentioned Daryl Williams getting the vet men. Guess what Connor's extension was? Three years, 21 million. He's just one of 12 running backs now with a contract valuation of at least 20 million. 13.5 million guaranteed. He's locked in for at least the next two years, man, unless they can somehow trade him after June 1st next year. Seems pretty unlikely. Like even a post June 1st cut next year would leave almost $8 million in dead money. Like that's too much for a team to really. Uh, warrant cutting ties with the guy. James Conner has the role. It's going to be one of those situations where you cross your fingers that he stays healthy, but God forbid he does. You're going to be having a lot of fantasy points. Daryl Williams, my God, top 50 running back right now? No, I'm out. Give me Khalil Herbert, Gus Edwards, and Jamal Williams ahead of him straight up, and especially when we can get them later in these drafts. When I would rather take Keontae Ingram in round 18 than Daryl Williams in round 12. Like, come the hell on. Yeah, I've got Daryl Williams at 53. The, the thing you're getting is just access like to the good offense, right? And the good schedule, you know, that you're not getting with some of the other guys. But to your point, like I'm basically, so the way, you know, the way my tiers work, you know, I'm setting it all up based on talent, opportunity, situation, all that kind of stuff. We have some special stuff coming for you guys later on that. You're going to be super excited about some things, but it's got to be, it's kind of top secret right now. Um, you know, it's, uh, we could tell you, but we might have to kill you. It's classified <laughs> kind of thing. Um, but when you look at Daryl Williams, the ADP has, has, is the last factor that goes into the way I set my tiers up. And so it's basically just dragging his ass up the board, <laughs> you know, because I mean, and, and you know, I want to have him in the range where somebody can see, okay, like I see him showing up in my queue over here. Where does Dwayne have him or where does Ian have him? Like, that's the way I'm thinking about, you know, using ADP for these. So I'm fine. Just my main thing is don't do it in round 12 because it, it, there's a real, like I said, there's a real sweet spot, like still going on in round 12 where there's too much talent. And, and I'm really trying to bet on talent more than some situation like this on a lesser talent um, when I'm in round 12. Now, every year that round may change a little bit, but this year that's kind of the sweet spot is right around round 12 um, is where that would happen. And so I just I don't get him because I'm I just have too many other priorities in that range. I like Man, I, I hear you. I looked at his ADP and I said, okay, I should probably get him up here, right? No, I can't rationalize rank him ahead of Matt Breida, man. <laughs> no, I'm 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 out on Daryl Williams. He's Do my you have him below Matt Breida right now? Yes, I have Matt Breida RB63 and Daryl Williams oh, RB64. It. I thought long and hard Make your about stand, it, hardest. and I am Make making stand. my stand against Daryl Williams. I want to give a quick shout out that, hey, if you do believe in Daryl Williams, well, there's no other place to go show how much you believe on him than over at Underdog Fantasy, the best place to play fantasy football this summer. Their best ball mania tournament has $10 million in total prize money, and the best part is you just draft your fantasy football team, and that's it. There's no waivers, no trades, no in-season management. Underdog gives you your best score each week of the season and the highest scores at the end of the year. When the champion of best ball mania last year drafted in June, so there's no time like the present to join Underdog and take your shot at a million-dollar draft. Plus, Underdog is going to double your first deposit up to $100 when you sign up with the promo code PFF. And if you play just 10 of those dollars using promo code PFF, you get a free PFF subscription. So what are you waiting for? Head on over to underdogfantasy.com or the App Store. Play $10 with code PFF and draft your best ball mania team today. Wide receiver season season. Marquise Brown, DeAndre Hopkins suspended. Rondale Moore, AJ Green, Antoine Wesley, Andy Isabella. Let's talk some Marquise Brown, Dwayne. The artist known as Hollywood is absolutely flying up draft boards right now. ADP as the wide receiver 16 over underdog fantasy. He did get better in year three, but based on his whole Ravens tenure, 2019 and 2021, he ranked 65th among 102 wide receivers in PFF receiving grade. He's 50th in yards per route run, 66 in yards per reception, 28th in targets per route run. You could argue that's the best stat of the group in terms of predicting future performance. So that is good for him. But man, Dwayne, how is he going to stand out in this room when DeAndre Hopkins didn't even stand out in this room last year? That's my problem with Marquise Brown. Right now, we are basically saying he's going to be better than he was last year, which, hey, 
He was a lot better with Lamar Jackson under center than Tyler Huntley and company. But when you finish ninth in the entire at your position in targets, I'd like to see a better finish than wide receiver 23 and PPR points per game. I understand it was Huntley. I don't know, man. Mark Andrews seemed to be just fine with those guys throwing him the football. So whatever, though. Look at the Cardinals last year. Weeks one through eight. DeAndre Hopkins had 46 targets. AJ Green and Antoine Wesley combined for 46 targets. Christian Kirk had 42 targets. Evans and Connor combined for 41. Rondale Moore had 35. That's like your entire offense within 10 targets of each other. What? Okay, what happens in weeks 13 through the wild card round? Green and Wesley combined for 59 targets. Ertz had 55. Christian Kirk had 52. Combination of Evans and Connor had 37. We want targets per route. We want that stat to be as high as possible. Rondale Moore is the only guy in the position that was higher. That was inside the top 50 last year inside this offense. Like Kirk and Hopkins couldn't have a top 50 targets per route rate. And the only reason why Rondale was in there was because he was being used in this more gadgety way. So Dwayne, I feel like with Marquise Brown, the volume, in my opinion, is far from guaranteed. Like he could just be in a mix with these guys, but we have to draft him at a massive premium to do it. And I like Marquise Brown. I think he's good. I'm not so sure he's great. So why are we going to draft him as a top 20 wide receiver? Um, I think he profiles almost the same as Mike Williams. I mean, we could say a lot of those same exact things about Mike Williams and his profile, but you're getting an offense um, that we think is going to be good. You're getting the quarterback that we think is going to be good. You're getting... Um, you know, the, the potential shootouts, which we've already talked about. And so when you look at Brown, like the main thing I'm buying into, everything you said is true. And so I, I you know, you told me before the the podcast started that you were going to bring some Marquise Brown heat. So um, <laughs> I don't have anything to argue with on any of those, though, because that's all stuff I have, like, you know, I've noted in his profile, like it could go wrong. But here's what I would say. Overall, I'm just buying the young profile. This is a 25, you know, he was the 25th pick, uh, you know, in the 2019 draft. So he's going into year four. We've had a wide receiver three finish in year two. We've had a wide receiver two finish in year three. Um, and then last year was really his best year. To your point on his PFF receiving grades, he is not. And so when you heard, when you folks hear me talk about these benchmarks, I just probably need to clarify because we, we've mentioned it before. But what I've done is I've gone back and I've built out essentially like here's what a wide the number one wide receiver two three four five six seven eight like all the way down through wide receiver 60 every 12 receivers is a new tier right a wide receiver one a wide receiver two a wide receiver three and then what i've done is i've actually pulled in those receivers and their data to see well what was their pff receiving grade what was their targets per route run so then i can give you an average of basically wide receiver ones usually have a pff receiving grade of this Wide receiver ones typically have a targets per route run of this. They typically have a yards per route run of this. And so when you look at Brown, like in his profile, like he his rookie season, even though he was a wide receiver five, he hit the wide receiver four threshold for PFF receiving grade. N nothing to write home about, but he hit the wide receiver three level for targets per route run and yards per route run. And then we already talked about he's got the wide receiver three, the wide receiver two finish. Last year was his best year. You know, he had a, you know, and now again, the biggest part that hasn't come up to your point is the PFF wide receiver grade. It was still a wide receiver four, but his targets per route run was wide receiver two worthy. Now to your point, the biggest red flag was the wide receiver five yards per route run, which was a 1.61. So he's been a 1.81, a 1.72, and a 1.61. So it's not a perfect profile to your point, but it's in the end, a former first round pick that's already had a wide receiver three and a wide receiver two finish playing on a good offense that should be in a lot of shootouts. Like I'm just, it's very, very similar to Mike Williams. It's it's like, now they're different players because like, obviously one is, is little and one is really big, <laughs> you know, but their profiles are very similar. And also the way they've historically, at least Mike Williams wasn't last year, the way they've historically been used really has been more, um, you know, as these explosive playmakers. Now the ADOT did come down some. Marquis Brown has been working more around the line of scrimmage. There's a lot of different things they can do with him. So I, I don't really have an argument against anything that you've said. I think that there is enough there um, that you can be a little bit worried about the profile. I think where it becomes, you know, tricky and you have to make your stand on Marquis Brown, and it, it seems like a lot of our podcasts like come down to this, is like, when you get to the DJ Moore, Deontay Johnson, Terry McLaurin, DK Metcalf tier, every like, time, <laughs> like, like, how do you feel about him versus those? Honestly, that's what's that's like this big dividing line. I'm like, are you above that or are you below that? Right. And so I have Mike Williams one spot above that tier. And Marquise Brown really profiles to be a very, very similar player. So it's like it, in the way I do my tiers, I'm trying to think about players that really are the same. I want to keep them together. 
And so I've, I've got Mike Williams and Marquise Brown both sitting right next to each other. I have Williams at 15, I have Marquise Brown at 16 on underdog. He's seven. Well, he was 17. You may have a, a later number on, on, on Hollywood is probably higher than that. He was wide receiver 17, like, you know, four days ago. Wide receiver 16. Now he could <laughs> yeah, look, go, that's, that's the best case scenario, but I, I think Williams does have a higher flow. Like, look, we're talking about maybe Kyler can get the 5,000 passing yards. We haven't seen him get to 4,000. Justin Herbert just hit 5,000 last year. So, so to be fair, I do think Mike is much more in. Like he got, he had a wide receiver one finish last year. So I hear you. Maybe Marquise could be looking ahead to it. And I have Marquise Brown ranked wide receiver 23. I just, as long as he keeps flying up the board like this, I do think I would take DJ Moore, Cortland Sutton, even guys like Deontay Johnson uh, ahead of him, because I'm just not overly convinced that Marquise Brown is this super high level talent, even as good as someone like Mike Williams. I mean, did you see the, uh, man, like it's just a tough look for me when you come out and he trashed, he's like, oh, I wasn't a part of the Raven system, bro. They just gave you 140 targets and you dropped three touchdowns in one game against the lions. Like, that's hard for me, Dwayne, when to, he's going to throw Lamar in the system under the bus when, as Warren Sharp put out that two-minute video, and you can see pretty clearly, and you can do this for a lot of wide receivers, so I'm not trying to totally bash Marquise Brown, but, like, man, last year he had every opportunity to really cash in and do the things we want him to do. I'm not sure he's going to be afforded enough targets to be able to make that happen this year. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, and that's why I have Mike Williams one spot ahead is basically Justin Herbert and, and you know, what we think about the passing yard. But again, like the profiles are just really close. I, it's, it's his profile overall is better than Sutton's. It's better than Judy's, you know, it's better than a lot of these other guys. So I'm still going to, I'm going to take him ahead of them. Um, but I like those guys and they're all, again, they're really close. Like they're, they're, they're really close. And I know people are like, oh, just make a stand. Like I'm fine taking Marquise Brown inside the top 20 to your, to your point. I'm not going to, I'm not forcing Marquise Brown, um, like every draft, like I'm not, I'm not forcing that. Um, but I'm fine being, you know, equal to where, you know, a lot of other people are going to be on him. I may be slightly overweight. Um, I still think it's just a really good profile for a player that this, that is this young. And then I know we'll talk about Deandre Hopkins in a minute, but Deandre Hopkins is in the window now, you know, and he's starting to deal with a lot of the injuries where we could see, you know, that cliff come and that suddenly opens up more. Yes. Tight ends can play, can play longer. Um, and tight ends, you know, typically we don't have to worry about it too much yet with where Zach Ertz is at, but he's at the spot where it starts to trail off. So I do think there's a potential boom case for Marquise Brown. I'm not saying it's like, you know, it is like 50th percentile of his, of his outcomes. Right. But like when you look over like it, you know, what the 80th percent of what he could potentially do, you know, is in this offense, I think it's approaching, you know, the, the low end of a wide receiver one, I think it could still get there. He just checks too many boxes. But again, I, I can't disagree with any of the stuff that you've thrown out there. Cause they're all things that I've noted as well. Um, that honestly keep me from pushing him, you know, any higher than where I have him. Um, because to me, like where I started the season, I just had him as graded as a talent right that i was worried about you know where the targets were going to come from like what you're talking about that was just below like the elites of of dj Moore, deontay johnson these other guys where we really know um like man like they can really demand all these targets um you know marcus brown is not quite to their level yet but just below are you concerned about the target share here because again like no one was getting even hopkins himself wasn't getting fed the ball last year yes in 2020 hopkins had 160 targets other than that, Kyler's never fed one receiver 110 targets. Like, I don't feel good about drafting Marquise Brown the third round if we're looking at someone that might struggle to, you know, hell, there's a chance he finishes with under 100 targets, Dwayne. Yeah, I think there's a, I mean, I think there's a chance of that, but again, I'm not going to overthink it. I'm just going to, I'm looking at the talent profile and I still think that it's really strong. It's in a good offense. And I just know that sometimes, like, as much as we try, like just the way seasons work out, we can't always necessarily project exactly how it's going to be. So I'm buying, the, he checks all the boxes I want, right? Now, the biggest question is the targets, but I can make the same argument for Sutton. I can make the same argument, you know, for Judy. Um, the thing that drags the guys down that we already talked about is, well, they don't have the quarterback or the, and they're not expected to be in a quality offense. So it's like, once you weigh all those things out, I think they all belong to be pretty close together. But if someone may, one, wants to make a stand on one of these guys for a particular reason, like here's the thing you could say, if you take DJ Moore and all of a sudden, you know, they signed Jimmy Garoppolo, you're going to wish that you had DJ Moore over Marquise Brown. Like, I don't doubt that, you know, um, Deontay Johnson, absolutely a better player than Marquise Brown. Like Deontay Johnson, let's just be honest. Like if Deontay Johnson was like playing with Tom Brady, we'd have him like wide receiver three. 
I no, don't know. I mean, about that. he might he he might be wide receiver too. No, um, no. Yeah, we would. We would. He's back, dude. We would absolutely have Deontay Johnson. I would have done. I guarantee you, Deontay Johnson would be in my top five. I don't think Deontay right. Johnson. I don't think Deontay Johnson would have started on the twenty twenty one Buccaneers. How about that? I think you're crazy. You think he's better than Evans, Goblin, or AB? Oh, I would take Deontay Johnson right now over, uh, you know, Mike Evans. I, look, I like Mike Evans, but I would take Deontay Johnson as a young ascending pro- profile over Mike Evans. Absolutely. I mean, Deontay Johnson on any of these elite offenses would be in the top five. Like, you give him any of these other quarterbacks, these up tempo offenses, we're just worried that his offense is going to slow down. You got to deal with either a rookie quarterback or Mitch Trubisky. Like, it's just, you know, those are the risks with Deontay Johnson. I have no, like, his talent profile screams like that, you know, he's, he's already, you know, a top five, top 10 receiver in the league to me. It's just a matter of his situation. I love targets per out run too. I do think you can pinpoint guys specifically Deontay and Waldo where maybe just maybe we're inflating that a bit too much, but this is not a Steelers preview. This is a Cardinals preview. I think we've gotten enough words about well, the, how- the thing with just real quick with Deontay is it, it's very different than Waddle. I'll give you more on Waddle than I will on Deontay. Deontay works intermediate. You know, he works underneath. He can work deep. It's just a matter of like the way they ran their offense, you know, whereas for Juju, yeah, literally like his capability set is like, I'm going to run drags and this underneath stuff. Deontay Johnson's just out there turning dudes around like, you know, with his route running. So um, I, I think that, you know, he's a really good player um, that would move up. But to your point, yeah, it's not a Steelers. I would just like to see a top five wide receiver talent. Maybe just maybe Dwayne average seven yards per target. I know it's not well, the stickiest you, stack. You just, you, that- you, I get it. You have to remember, though, like the things that are the most impacted by the quarterback play, you know, are the yards per route run. Now, I mean, I think where you could, you know, ding Deontay Johnson um, is his PFF receiving grade. It's a 74.6, but we count drops against them. Right. So um, drops are a big part of what brings Deontay Johnson's PFF receiving grade down um, versus some of his peers. But when you look at his PPR points per game to hit a 17.3 already, like and look back historically at the people that have done that and done what he's done in the first three years, like the list is pretty, pretty good. Here are the wide receivers averaging fewer than seven yards per target over the past three years with at least 100 targets. Adam Humphreys, Zay Jones, Anthony Miller, Larry Fitzgerald, Muhammad Sanu, Jakeem Grant, Jalen Rager, D.D. Westbrook, Greg Ward, Nikhil Harry, Albert Wilson, LaVisca Chanel, Juju, and Deontay Johnson. I don't want him to be on that list, Dwayne. It's a very quarterback induced stat, Ian. Like but that, that, that one correlates very heavily with quarterback. Yards per target is huge for that. Target depth, you know, it's part of it. They typically own, you know, their A dot, but like the way the quarterback plays matters a lot for yards per target. Let's talk about something a little more positive, and that is Ron Dale Moore. I moved Marquise Brown down the ranks, and I boomed Ron Dale Moore up the ranks. We were talking so, so about. Where did, where did you end up with Marquise again? Sorry. 23rd. Again, I don't hate him, but at 16, that's too high for me. Which is rare. In year 23. No, we're good. <laughs> yeah, it is rare. <laughs> All right, With I know more. Let's do this. The constant drumbeat, as we've been alluding to, man. March, here's here's some Cliff Kingsbury quotes from throughout the offseason. March 29th. A bigger role, there's no doubt. Last year, just with the numbers, with Christian, A.J. Green, Hop, he kind of got lost in the shuffle more than he should have. He's a dynamic playmaker. With Christian leaving, we expect him to fill that role. June 2nd. He feels like he can step into Christian's role and play at a really high level inside here, and we do too. June 3rd, we utilize him in different ways than we will this year. We kind of got it to him in space and did some things and used him on some checkdowns, but he's a dynamic route runner. I think that's what people are going to see. He's really good getting out of his cuts, good at the top of routes, so I think people are going to see a different side of him. June 14th, Rondale is going to play a lot more. He's taken real strides this offseason. Dude, this is like... The Kyle Shanahan talking about like Jimmy Garoppolo getting traded thing. This is not a beat reporter. This is not training camp news about Rondale looking good. This is not who we love. This is not Matt Harmon's reception perception telling us that Rondale Moore is like just some god that's being underused. This is Cliff Kingsbury telling us that he is taking Christian Kirk's role, which yielded over 100 targets last year and presumably could do so again. And man, he was honest with us last year telling us that Rondale really grouped in, not with Hopkins and AJ Green, but with the other group. And yes, I know last year when Hopkins got hurt, he couldn't even play ahead of A.J. Green and Antoine Wesley. I don't, and this is messed up that it wasn't even a consideration for Kingsbury, but I don't think it was. They have slot receivers, and last year that was Kirk and Rondale Moore, and they have outside receivers, Hopkins, A.J. Green, and Antoine Wesley. Dwayne, like, do you really see Rondale Moore starting the first six weeks of the year, and then all of a sudden 
Hopkins comes back and they put him on the bench and slide Mark. Like, I don't think they're going to no, change their whole no, offense around. Yeah. No, AJ Green's going to go to the bench when DeAndre Hopkins comes back, you know? Be- because especially it's different if, than last year. This is different. This is now side well, wide receiver. Well, right. Christian Kirk's gone. Yeah. That just, oh, that's Rondell Moore's spot. Like Rondell Moore's going there unless we get a complete curveball surprise and all of a sudden Hollywood's playing inside. You know, they could rotate Hollywood down there some, but my guess is Hollywood's going to play outside. You know, and that's the beauty of getting Hollywood over Christian Kirk. You're getting a guy that can play outside and stretch the field, not just from the slot. Christian Kirk's a nice player, but really, like when you start to look at his splits between slot versus outside, like there is a huge difference for Christian Kirk. So, um, yeah, I'm down with Rondell Moore. In fact, you know, um, I wrote an article yesterday that will come out on or you know late last night, sending Ian screenshots. Uh, you know, I wrote an article that will be coming out tomorrow, and it's really about eight players. You know, that I think, and some of them will surprise you. You know, so you guys can go check it out. There's different ways you can think about this, but that really, you know, should see a lot more targets this season. And 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 Rondell Moore's in here, and so basically what I did, Ian, is I took. You know, uh, I went back and I looked number one at Christian Kirk. He was out there and he handled 82%, you know, of the routes last year. Um, it was 73%, though, over the first eight games um, before Hopkins was hurt. So, what that means is Christian Kirk, what was happening last year, sometimes um, whenever uh, Hopkins was out, he was actually getting to, um, you know, bump outside. He was getting to bump outside when DeAndre Hopkins wasn't available. So I don't think we'll get that for Rondell Moore. So I didn't give him that 82% of the route. Like, you know, I ran three versions of what I think this could look like. Um, You know, last year in the games Rondell actually played, he was out there for 53%, you know, of the routes, which is a lot better than what most people think. He missed a lot of games, what makes his overall route participation 40% that sometimes he's in a route when his team drops back to throw the football. Um, But it was really 53%, which is not terrible. So I kind of used that as his floor. I gave him 57%. And then I gave him, you know, just right around where Kirk was, you know, in the games with Hopkins, right around 70%. And then I gave him, you know, a scenario where they're just having to go balls to the wall and throw the ball all the time, stay in 11, stay in 10 personnel, because we've already talked about their schedule. And I gave him, you know, upward closer to 80%, you know, route participation and kind of the sweet spot in the middle. Here's the one thing I see, we'll say with Ron Moore had that 24% targets per route run um last year but you really that 34 out of his 64 targets came on screen passes like that's just not going to continue you can't get that you can't get that much of your target share um off of screen passes if it did it would like be a complete outlier it also makes it harder to tell how good is he at really generating his own targets right because the team is basically building them for you um, like what we see sometimes with running backs versus you having to beat the cornerback that's across from you or whoever the defender is or the covers that they're throwing at you so for his targets per route run, I gave him a range between 17 and 23%. And like just to kind of keep it sweet and short, like the middle spot I landed on is Rondell still having a shot at 90, you know, targets. But I think he has an upside, you know, of where maybe he could get closer to 100. And like the best case would be if the if his targets per route last year were really just true and he was out there 80% of the time, you know, he'd see 120 targets, you know, in the offense. Obviously, that means that they're running a lot of plays. But I think that he's probably going to be a wide receiver three, you know, out of the gate, Ian, um, just because the three, the three games we talk about right away on the Cardinal schedule. I think the other beauty with Rondell Moore is you're going to know really quick <laughs> because with Hopkins out, if Rondell Moore's not out there on week one, and you can get this guy in round 12 right now, if you're not in a freak league, like underdog where every wide receiver is taken by round seven, you know, um, just kidding underdog. We love you. Obviously <laughs> but the wide receivers go so fast. Like he goes in round nine there, the end of round nine, um, whereas over like an FFPC, these other places, you can get him around 12, your home league, you're probably going to get Ron more like round 13 or 14. And this is a guy that could, you're going to know really quick out of the gate, what the Cardinals plans are for him with Deandre Hopkins out for six games. And guess what? With Hopkins being out, like you said, even when he comes back, like that's not Rondell's spot. The bigger thing that's going to let us know what's going to happen is just the, the the schedule right out of the gate. So I feel really good about Rondell. I think you treat him as a wide receiver four with upside. He's going to give you wide receiver three weeks right out, right out, right away. And I think he could give you some potential boom weeks, you know, right away. And it could be a guy that, you know, everybody's going, oh my God, how did we not end up with Rondell Moore on our team? Because of that final point, I'm moving up to wide receiver 45, current ADP, wide receiver 55. I want Rondale Moore to be next to my name when it's like these are the guys I'm highest on this year. That's what I'm thinking here, Dwayne. Look at the rush attempts, too. 
if anyone's going to take some of those Chase Edmonds design yes, screens, agreed. it could be Rondale Moore. Like he has that. That's the thing. We're talking about these leftover targets with Christian Kirk and Chase Edmonds. Rondale Moore, for both guys, really profiles as the best bet to get those. And he had 18 rush attempts last year. Like We could be looking at a Rams, Robert Woods type player here where, mm -hmm. yeah, we're getting 100, hopefully 100 targets. But then when you add 15, 20 rush attempts on, I'll take that tiebreaker over week 17 matchups, Dwayne, but I'm sure, yeah, I know he has that going for him as well. You, you could be looking at a Curtis Samuel two years ago yep. with the Panthers kind of thing, honestly, with Rondell Moore. So yeah, people are just too low on Rondell. Um, I agree with you. You know, he needs to be in the forties, like uh, the tier, you know, where he's around a lot of these other guys, you know, Garrett Wilson, Russell Gage, Chris Olave, a lot of these young guys with upside, people are pushing him down outside of that. And you, I think that's a mistake. I think he still needs to be up there with those players. Let's talk some DeAndre Hopkins. Last year wasn't going great for him. Again, more so, I think, due to the targets than anything. But if you just look at the entire season, worked as the wide receiver 19 on a per-game basis. And if you just want to take away week eight and the couple games he tried to come back and play, he was a wide receiver 17 uh, on a per-game basis in weeks one through seven. Some of the underlying stuff doesn't look great, though, Dwayne. As we know, 30-year-old year old wide receivers do start to have a higher bust rate. Lowest marks in PFF receiving grade and yards per route run since 2016. Right now, wide receiver 37 over underdog. I have him wide receiver 39. I think that spot's about okay for him. But when I've had Kyler, when I've, when I've been able to draft Kyler, which has been a lot in round five or six, I've been more willing to take Hopkins in those lineups, obviously. But as a whole, man, I just don't want to be overexposed to DeAndre Hopkins. I feel like we've most likely seen his best years. And the same exact volume concerns I have with Marquise Brown, we're going to have with DeAndre Hopkins as well. I mean, Cliff Kingsbury just said in an interview, like, once we have Hopkins back, like, we're going to have a bunch of guys wanting to get the ball. Uh, and But it's a good problem to have. Like, yeah, it's a good problem for you, Cliff. Not so much for us. So when I see Hopkins, you know, going next to these wide receivers, like Thielen, like Michael Thomas, Amon Ra, Devontae, but even like Burks and Ayuk and Renfro, Russell Gage, like I want those guys ahead of DeAndre Hopkins because we're not missing six games to start with. And I think we could be looking at, this is not getting Hopkins back as a top 10 wide receiver. He's probably going to be a middling wide receiver too, I think, even when he's back. And maybe that's aggressive. Yeah, I think with Hopkins, the one thing we have to be careful of, um, I agree on everything that you said, and and we have to be careful with the profile. I'm always very leery, though, when we see the profile slip, like in a year where a player dealt with so many injuries. And so the thing people forget is in week one, um, basically you saw the, the rib injury occur. And so he still played through that in weeks two and three. Um, was questionable even week three. Then he finally kind of got healthy again. You kind of just start to get his stride and then he got hurt again. So like if you look at week one when he was completely healthy, he was a 24% target share. You look at week four when he was, you know, actually got to practice and then he got to play in a game because week two and three, he didn't practice. Um, so in week four, 24% target share. Week five, still healthy, 32% target share, right? And then you get the week seven, 35 percenter, and then he gets hurt. So that's my my one positive that I would throw out there for DeAndre Hopkins, it's still very possible that this is a 25 to 30 percent target share player. And we just, you know, they de he was just dealing with the injuries and that really just zapped him of being able to do, you know, what he needs to be able to do. So um, the other thing I would say is some of some of the older profiles that we've seen that have just absolutely freaking boomed uh, and been able to continue whenever they were older and still have these really big seasons profile more similar to DeAndre Hopkins, like Brandon, Brandon Marshall, right? These guys that weren't necessarily just counting on their speed to get them open, not necessarily counting just on quickness to get them open, but they've just got this raw physical mentality to their game. And this my ball mentality is, you know, Cecil Lammy over on the audible would say like, he's got that. And it's a guy that, that Kyler trusts. So I think those are the positive bull bull reasons to still consider Hopkins where you can get him um, to your point. Like it's just tough because he's going to miss six games already, but I'm pretty torn on how much I feel like I need to really buy into the fact that, you know, DeAndre Hopkins is done and we're only going to see a 20% target share. Now, if Hopkins comes back and balls out, like we say, then you should really be screaming at me about why the hell is, you know, Hollywood Brown going, you know, in the top 15. I think it's a super legit, you know, uh, I, I that's my biggest concern with uh, getting a player like Hollywood. Yeah, the schedule and everything works out, but I, I really don't know how things are going to look once DeAndre Hopkins comes out, comes back, because there's really kind of two sides of the coin on this one. We, we really could just have a really good player that's still ready to rock 
you know, uh, and just the injuries, you know, zapped him. Or we could have a player that is starting to decline because to your point, like they're at that point in their career. Not out on him. Please don't interpret this as that. Again, just two spots away from where he's going. And as an overall rank, I have him as a 77th overall player right now in underdog. He's 76. So pretty much agreeing with the consensus because you're right, Dwayne. Maybe he does go back and gets back on that 160 target pace and he just takes over as the number one that we know he can be. It's just tough with those. Again, I don't want to hold hold a, against a guy when he's playing through the pain, but like the only other wide receiver I can think of that was like actively playing a hurt out there for 90% plus routes and like was just not getting the ball because they were hurt was like Tyler Lockett and how the Seahawks would do that a couple years ago. So maybe that was the case uh, with Hopkins, I guess at that point. In well, and I think it's the context, you know, I mean, of, of like, you can't even practice. Right. And then they're going to, you know, <laughs> I think what was funny is like every week he was a game time decision, but they <laughs> kept putting him out there for the whole game. It wasn't like he was going out there and only running around like 60% of the dropbacks. Like he was playing almost every single snap. Well, yeah. I mean, but pe teams do do that. Right. I mean, we have, we have seen that at times to your point. It's not that not every team handles it the same way. I just think it's pretty interesting that whenever he's finally not on the injury report, like he has these big weeks. So, um, and, and it's, it's, and Hopkins is a guy that, you know, it's not like he's been injured a ton really, you know, in his career. So I think looking at him, you know, he'll be, and, and here's the thing, you know, with Hopkins, you know, on the age, I mean, he will be 30, he'll be 30.3 years old, you know, when the season starts this year. So, um, I, I think there's definitely some red flags, you know, just like what we've brought up with some of the other receivers that are older. It's just part of the game. Like it happens. Um, and, and we've mentioned it. We can't tell you for sure which one, but one of them probably, you know, is going to far underperform like what our expectations are of on the season. And it could be Hopkins. Do you have any thoughts on him? Maybe not being the same player, not on PEDs. I mean, isn't that a real thing? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm not. I, we can't I, really I like measure that, it. I feel like, yeah, that's the problem with stuff like that. I, I'm not, I'm not debating it. But like, once I get like way out, like into some of these other things like this, if there was data and something around it, and not that you can't factor it in any, but I don't typically let things like that um, really push me around in my process. Yeah. And the only reason why is because then I can't go back and really measure myself at the end of each year to say how good was I at this, and then like, you know, how was I good? How was I bad? So like, a lot of what and you I mean, it probably bore some people, to be honest, because you'll hear me say a lot of the same things over and over. Um, but it helps me have conviction around my takes. It helps me measure how good I am at my takes, um, which, you know, we miss a lot. <laughs> you know, we miss a lot. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not going to overthink that one. But um, like, could it could it be a factor? Yeah, it's not going to change my opinion of him as far as, you know, where I've got him ranked, though. We have missed a lot, but this year we're getting everything right. If not, we'll work harder next yeah, year. Duh. So, yeah, we're going to get uh, every, between us 110%. <laughs> Where do you have Hopkins ranked? Um, I've got him at 36. Okay. So what just, I will say is when he gets to me, um, didn't didn't you take him on underdog just the other day or he go right in front of you when you that, took That's him what already? I was saying. When, like, you, when I, you took Kyler. Ky Kyler's one of my highest exposed quarterbacks right now. So naturally I'm going to go out and take Hopkins a little more for those lineups. So that's why I'm, I don't want to be too far out on the guy, but if I don't have Kyler in my lineup, I think my chances of taking Hopkins are a lot less. So here's what I would say. Um, let's think about it this way. Amari Cooper is going at pick uh, 24 on underdog. I would rather have Deandre Hopkins for my season. I'm not arguing against Amari Cooper, but I've got, I'm lower on Amari Cooper. I'm just worried about the quarterback. I'm he's a 20% targets per route guy with DeAndre Hopkins. I know that I've seen him be a 30 percenter. Right. And so there, that means automatically in his range of outcomes, there's a greater chance of DeAndre Hopkins when he plays just destroying than Amari Cooper. Right. And so what that means is like, once you get him back now, you got to get through the six weeks. That's a long time. That's half your fantasy season. Six weeks is, is not just nothing, but to draft anyone inside your top 36 that is going to miss six games, they have to have an absolute bull case scenario in their out, range of outcomes. And he does have it at least. Would, if there's no suspension, would Hopkins be ranked outside of our top 12? If he did not have a suspension, um, well, I guess I should just go back and look at my February. Those February ranks are still <laughs> up where, earlier. where he was at. But I had him in the same tier as Mike Evans and Keenan Allen, and I have them at 12 and 13. So about right there. Oh. That's what I was thinking. I was looking. I have Keenan 11, Mike 12, and I would. I would <laughs> that, that tier that I have is called boomers and booming offenses. He would have fit right in. Yep, that's perfect. Where would, <laughs> where would Marquise Brown be ranked? Uh, Marquise Brown 
would be. I feel like they'd per- flip. I feel like their rankings would almost flip, Twain. Yeah, they probably. I don't think they would completely flip just because uh, Brown's profile is strong enough as a young player. Like he would be. I wouldn't have Brown. I would have Brown still ahead of the Rashad Bateman, Gabriel Davis, Elijah Moore, that group, just because those are one year guys, right? And their their profile's not quite as strong. So where he would be right now in my ranks, he'd probably be like 26, 27. So, you know, kind of closer to where you have him now. Would you take him ahead uh, of Sun God? Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah. But it's they would be close, like they would be like six spots apart. Then, like right now, you know, Marquise Brown is like twelve spots ahead of Amon Ross St. Brown. Um, yeah, look, you, Ian knows he's getting to me when he asks anything about Sun God. <laughs> that's like his truth. That's how he's like, I'll really find out what Dwayne thinks. I'm gonna ask Sun God right now. I got him thirteen spots apart. Like in the scenario you just named, they'd be like five spots apart, four spots apart. Let's talk a little Zachers. And yeah, we don't. AJ Green, Antoine Wesley. No, I think they're probably going to rotate, which I think is just going to render both guys as useless. Yeah. And just so folks know, look, we love AJ Green, but like uh, all the underlying data on him, like um, it's, it, it's flatlined like two years ago. Like yeah. it, it's, and when I say flatline, not as an, oh, holding steady, I mean, as in like there's, there's, there's not, there's not much life left. Moving on to tight end, we got Zach Ertz, Trey McBride, and Max Williams. Zach Ertz got traded to the Cardinals in week seven. From week seven to the rest of the season, number one tight end targets Mark Andrews. Tied for second, Zach Ertz and Travis Kelsey. Obviously, a lot of that did come without DeAndre Hopkins in the picture. But guess what? Hopkins is already not in the picture for six games of next season. And just, you know, I'm not against on off NFL splits if the sample size is large enough. Spare me this two game split of Zach Ertz with DeAndre Hopkins <laughs> that had that what what Kyler throw 15 passes in that Chicago Bears game. Like that's that's yeah, why when yeah. you have two game sample sizes like it's just it's a slippery slope. I mean I put that in the same category as asking me if I think you know DeAndre Hopkins can't play without PEDs. <laughs> <laughs> well I know I, was, I I'm messing with you man. I'm messing with you. With Zachers, his tight end finishes in Fantasyland and the Kyler Murray starts. Now, he did have an overall tight end one performance with Colt McCoy, so shout out there. But with Kyler under center, tight end six, 14, 40 in that Bears game, 12, 8, 5, 10, and 7. Like, Dwayne, he was getting peppered with targets down the stretch. Weeks 14 to 18, 7, 11, 13, 9, and 10. And the man got absolutely paid. Three-year, $31.65 million extension includes $17.5 million guaranteed. Now just one of 11 tight ends making at least $10 million annually. So, yes, Trey McBride, second-round pick. Seems like he has a very bright future ahead. I don't think he's even going to be more than this Second tight end. Like, I think Zach Ertz, the amount of money they're paying him, how could you pay him that much money and not continue to play him in an every down role? He was out there for at least 70% of the snaps in every single game after his just first game, which he got traded and was on a short week anyway. So, looking at the Cardinals, they have been 15th in pass attempts with at least two tight ends on the field since 2019. But, Dwayne, I guess the question is like, do we really think either McBride or Max Williams, who was their week one starter, could turn this into a committee of sorts because I don't. And because of that, I would take them at tight end 10. I think he, him versus Dallas Goddard is a pretty great discussion. Yeah, I have him at 10 as well. I, Zach Ertz for me, um, you know, unless you're you know, just doing the weight on Gronk thing, you know, yeah. um, is basically like, hey, last stop. <laughs> don't if, yep. if you don't have a tight end yet, uh, like Dwayne didn't in the draft with Ian and Nathan, two days ago and then the, Ian took Zach Ertz, which I knew you would because you had, you know, <laughs> Kyler. Kyler Murray, it's coming back to me. And then the guy after you almost times out and he's like, Gronk. <laughs> and so I got screwed. I did not get either one. And now I'm going to have to really eat my Albert O take, uh, which I missed on <laughs> him too. And I had Irv Smith, but anyway, um, Zach Ertz. Yeah. He's that last guy. He's the one that like, when you get down there and again, like all the other, even though, yeah, he's going to be 32 years old this year. Um, you know, Hey, Ian, you didn't mention, I can't believe this. Like Zach Ertz, all these years of, uh, you know, no yak, like last year, <laughs> wasn't it like a career high in yards after the catch? Probably. I'm Cause he, no, sure, he I'm had that sure one, was. his first game with the Cardinals, he had that 50 yard touchdown. So that like probably, you know, I don't want to remove the 50 yard touchdown, but I'm guessing if he did. Yeah. He was a three, two, a three, one, a two, eight in last year popping at a 4.8 but he did like again Dwayne like again we're trying to learn every single year from our mistakes I think one of my bigger mistakes last year was writing off Zach Ertz as a washed player when in 2020 he was dealing with one injury uh from start to finish of that year so he 
he is 32. I can't guarantee he's going to be, you know, the healthiest version of himself moving forward. But in 2021, he was healthy and he passed the eye test. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, man, uh, you mentioned it. There's no need to talk about the splits, you know, with, you know, Hopkins in versus as just, it's too small yeah. and it's fine. You can look at it and just kind of have it in your mind, but it's, it shouldn't, I don't think it's going to really, you know, wait your, and look, here's the thing we've already talked about this offense. If Hopkins isn't dominating it, it's just going to be spread out. Right. Like, I think that's pretty much all of our expectations. Like I could see it finish in any order, right. It could finish, uh, Hopkins 23, Marquise Brown 21%, Zach Ertz 20 and 18% to Rondell. Like you could flip all those though and say, you know, that Zach Ertz is at 22 and, you know, Hollywood's 20 and, you know, Hopkins is 21. Like it, it could be any, it could be anywhere in there, right? It's kind of similar to what we talk about with, you know, the Denver offense. And honestly, like it probably, it's, it's really hard to have three receivers get over 20%. Um, you know, but, but it can happen. You know, you can't just, you just can't have one getting like a 30 percenter and then everybody, well, we saw it one time with, with new England back in the day, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm not that worried about Max Williams. I'm not that worried, um, about Trey McBride to your point, even though like some really solid draft capital and really the number one rated tight end, you know, as, uh, you know, coming out of college, it's just, it's so hard, man, to get on the field, you know, as a tight end. I think, I think the way Trey McBride will get his snaps is because they do use enough 12 personnel. Like that's kind of the, that's Cliff Kingsbury's kind of little sneaky thing. He's like, I don't just run 11. I run 10 and I run 12 personnel, you know? So he kind of mixes those things in. Um, but I think that's the path really for Trey McBride to see, you know, get some work as a rookie, you know, give Ertz a breather here and there. But I'd kind of be surprised if Ertz doesn't get to like that 80% route at a minimum 75% that we're looking for. I feel pretty comfortable that he's going to be there. My thoughts. Exactly. All right. Let's quickly conclude and just wrap up everything we just talked about. Kyler Murray, Dwayne and I both have him as our QB2. Right now, he's going as the QB5. Happy to scoop him up in the fifth. Every now and then, even early six-round underdog drafts of all shapes and sizes. At running back, James Conner, someone that just has that workload you cannot ignore. My RB13, Dwayne's RB14. There are guys like Javante, DeAndre Swift, Aaron Jones that you want to take ahead of him, sure. But really, you know, if you're going to fade the guy purely because you think he's going to get hurt, ask yourself the same question. What if he doesn't get hurt? And I think you'll see based on what we had last year in that sample size, based on the money he got, it's going to be a pretty nice year for him. Daryl Warren, someone that I am especially out on. Dwayne's being a little bit more understanding for now. Uh, just based on the money at hand, based on when he got signed, based on all the things he needs to go his way in order to get on the field, I just do not think he's worth it in the 11th or 12th round of drafts at the moment. At wide receiver, Dwayne's a little more with the group, with the consensus of Marquise Brown, just having being in a good situation. I have as a top 24 receiver as well. I will not be taking him in the third round, though, in most fantasy drafts. DeAndre Hopkins is, is Hopkins is someone going right in that wide receiver three borderline, and he has a much better ceiling than a lot of those guys. We do need to keep in mind, though, that taking six games off the plate does certainly hurt. Love, love, love Rondale Moore. I think we need to start just trying to say his name once a podcast to really drive that point home. AJ Green, Antoine Wesley, guys, we're not too worried about. Shout out Andy Isabella still on the roster. Free Andy. And then finally at tight end, Dwayne and I both have Zachary's tight end 10. I think Dwayne put it best saying that he is, you know, you need your tight end one, get Zachers, because after that, you are really, you know, playing a dangerous game there in the late round tight end position. Sound about right, Mr. McFarlane. No, it sounds really good. The only one other thing I would add, um, like to kind of close this out, you know, we talk a lot about like what players get paid, all these different things. You know, I think you do also have to consider like what the Cardinals gave up to go get Marquise Brown, right? I mean, giving up a first round draft pick is worth a lot more than what some of these teams they got a third back out, though, just going out. I don't care, it's a first round pick. Like, it's a first it's, and a third with Marquise as a throw in, you could argue. That's like saying, it's like saying Dan Arnold got traded for a, you know, come on. Marquise Brown, and you get what back? It was Marquise and a third for a first. Yeah, still, it's a first round pick. Like, if you go look at, like, the, if you look at the way the NFL thinks about, you know, draft picks, like the drop off from a first round pick to a third round pick may, may as well be like eternity. Like, it's huge. Like, the chart basically goes like this. So, like, for me, like that definitely matters um, that they're they're spending that, you know, capital to go get him um, and bring him to the team. I think I, I you and I definitely disagree on that. I think even though you're throwing you're getting the third, you know, it's still a big it's a, still a big commitment to move your first round pick. I just think that's important to know. It's not like it's a sixth. OK, it's still a huge difference. Like <laughs> in the way the turn in the terms of the way the NFL player, you know, the guys that are making these decisions, 
it's it's a huge difference. Let's pull up the Jimmy Johnson trade chart. Isn't that what they still use these pull days? It just, it's not Marquise for. A I don't first, think they all though. use it, but yeah, that's the one I'm I'm thinking of. All right, let's see. Round this, one. This, or, this this is good live podcasting. Round and, one pick and, what? Yeah, like round I'm round sorry. one pick twenty three. I think that's seven hundred sixty points. We'll say a bottom of the third round pick. Pick number ninety is one forty. Pick, but that's what I'm saying, man. Like round six and shit's like round eighteen. Like it matters. It's it's good. They showed good investment in him, but you know they use a second round pick on Rondale Moore. You tell me that's not pretty close. Yeah, but look look at yeah look at where look at how much they drop off though. Like the seven sixty. Like obviously the very top, the number one pick is worth three thousand, right? And so then yeah. you start to drop down. But you're looking over at the a third round pick. You know I don't even know where Arizona's was, but. Assuming it's somewhere around where their first round pick was, 155 versus 760, that's huge. So you could argue that Mark they value Marquise Brown as an upper second round pick. No, I mean, because if you subtract the 150 from the 760, um, you're yeah. still not out of the you're still not out of the first round. Oh, we're cause... pretty close. No, you're not. <laughs> we're like Christian Watson level. <laughs> no, you we're we're Ian trying to make a point close, but Mar Marquise <laughs> Brown is Christian <laughs> Watson. That's what I'm trying to say here. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Look, right. it it was pretty close to Marquise for a first, but that third is just enough to I, I like Rondell Moore a little more. That's okay. Well, no, I like Rondell Moore. Like, I mean, that that's not that's not the issue. That's um, it's, 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 this is just about the Marquise Brown thing, but anyway, thought Should we, out there. do you want to go through like every single pick in the Jimmy Johnson trade value? <laughs> do you think, nope. I think if people haven't turned us off yet, um, <laughs> like this, that will definitely get it done. If you want to do that, All <laughs> just, right. that, that last pick is worth one, <laughs> one point. It goes from 3000, a scale of 3000 to one, like, <sighs> to and, and one. you folks can figure out everything in between. Who's the first Mr. Irrelevant that comes to mind for you? Uh, I don't even know. Swag Kelly, baby. That's the only one. Oh, uh, yeah. All right. Let's end Swag it on. Kelly. Let's end it on Swag Kelly. For Dwayne, Swag. I'm in Swag. Thanks as always for tuning in to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. And until next time, take care. Everybody.